want you to turn with me in your Bibles to the gospel according to Mark. Mark chapter 11, and we'll get there in just a few minutes. Starting today, we're going to begin to turn all of our attention toward the crucifixion and the resurrection so that we can celebrate well being informed when it comes to Easter just a few weeks away. And as we read this text in a few moments, I want you to look for just little glimpses of the humanity of Jesus Christ. In the passage we're going to read today in the larger text, we see that he's hungry. He's had dinner the night before with Mary and Martha. And what a glorious detail that is, that our Lord Jesus in his human flesh experienced life much like you and I do. We also see that he was divine because in the larger passage here we see Jesus drying up a barren fig tree. What a beautiful detail that is that our Lord Jesus in his humanity was also divinity. He was God. And the winds and the waves, even they obeyed his voice. We're also going to see some details about how relevant uh, he is. And boy, when he turned that fig tree to being completely withered, he got the attention of those around him. And when he had their attention, here's what he said. You're going to see greater things than this. We also see in all of these details put together his authority. We're going to see him today look around in one instance at all things, at one single glance, and he's going to take in all that's around him. Now, if you were to read through or study through the Gospel of Mark, when you get to this point in chapter 11, you reach a very pivotal moment. Jesus is on the Mount of Olives. He's overlooking Jerusalem. Now, he's been there many times, but this time when he descends from the Mount of Olives on this particular day, he's going to be setting into motion the events of his death, burial, and resurrection. And friends, we're beginning today, as I've already said, to look forward to that celebration. The events of this particular day take place on a Sunday And before the sun goes down that following Friday, he will be crucified for your sin and mine. He's going to be buried, and three days later, he will have defeated death, hell, and the grave. Can somebody give him praise? He is worthy. Friends, don't ever, ever forget The grave had no hold on him, and it has no hold on us either. That's That's good news. As we go through this passage today, we're going to see that up to this point, he's told his disciples to keep his identity a secret. Now things are getting ready to change because he's going to reveal a new strategy. On this day, Jesus will begin to draw attention to himself. The question is why? Well, he's going to do so because he's going to fulfill fulfill an ancient prophecy in these verses that we're getting ready to read. He does so because he's about to present himself to the nations as the king. You see, hundreds of years before, the prophet Zechariah, wrote these words in chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteousness and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Imagine those words being written hundreds and hundreds of years before we see the events unfold in Mark chapter 11. So let's read these verses together. We'll start in verse 1 and we'll read through verse 11. 
How many of you are struggling right now with allergies? Anybody other than me? Well, you can relate. <laughs> Look at what happens here. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying that colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let him go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now what I want to do today is I want to show you a lot of little details that we can learn about who Jesus is in this passage of Scripture. You see, one of our goals ought to be when we study the Bible to draw closer to Christ. And one of the ways we can draw closer to Christ is to learn more about Him. So that's what we're going to try to do today. And we're going to do it as we look at this title. So if you're a note taker, write this down. I want to talk to you today about a picture of triumph. And all I'm going to do is give you three statements. Of those three statements, I'm going to give you two details of each. So if you want to get your nice little outline put together this morning, it's going to be real simple. Three statements with two details each. That's all we're going to do. Now we might do some hollering and spitting along the way, but that's really all we're going to do this morning. And then we're going to give an invitation. I'm going to ask you to come join this church. I'm going to ask you to come be baptized. I'm going to ask you to come and pray. I'm going to ask you to come and give your life to Christ if you've never made that decision. So here's the first detail. As I look at this picture of triumph, I want to show you the person of this triumph. And the person of this triumph is found in verses 1 through 6. So as we watch the Lord in action in these verses, we are allowed to catch just a few glimpses of His glory. It's the early morning, and Jesus is making preparations to go to Jerusalem. He's moving through some little villages, and He's on the top of the mountain that we call the Mount of Olives. He's walking through Bethpage, which means literally the house of unripe figs. He's walking through Bethany, which means the house of dates. And Jesus had some dear friends with him that were from Bethany, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Lazarus, whom he had just recently brought back from the grave. He's been staying with them during the last few days on earth. They are very close friends of his. And Jesus has just performed one of the most outstanding miracles of his earthly ministry, and that being the resurrection of Lazarus. But remember what he's saying to his disciples? You're going to see even greater things than this. Now we find Jesus standing on top of the Mount of Olives, He's preparing to make his descent into the city below from the top of that mountain. That mountain stands about 2,600 feet above sea level. And Jesus from that perspective or that point could see all of the beautiful city spread out before him. Now I want you to keep in mind, 
that these events occurred during the week leading up to Passover. And historians tell us that the population of Jerusalem was somewhere around 80,000 people at that time. But during Passover, between 2 and 3 million people will crowd into this city to celebrate the Passover. These people came in from all over the region, and they come in with great anticipation. They're looking forward to God doing something there in their presence. And God will do some of his greatest work during this particular Passover. And unfortunately, most of those millions of people are going to miss it. Just like today, as God continues to do great things, many people continue to miss it. So Jesus chooses this moment to reveal himself to the nation of Israel as the king of all nations. He chooses this moment to let Israel know that their king has arrived. And as he makes this appearance and we see this person, here are the two things I want you to notice. I want you to notice a little something about his personality. Look at the details in this story. In his personality, we see tremendous detail. Jesus sends two of his disciples ahead into this village. And he says, you're going to go and get a donkey colt for me and bring it back. He tells them exactly where they're going to find it. He tells them that you're going to see people standing around. He tells them that they're probably going to ask you what you're doing. And he even gives them some answers. He gives them details about this donkey. And he says this donkey is never going to have been ridden before. And when his men go to complete this assignment, they find that everything is exactly like Jesus said it would be. Now, here's a great question. How did Jesus know this? Well, in some of my research, here's what I discovered. A lot of writers agree that what Jesus did was he had snuck into that city ahead of his disciples. He had already talked to the owners of this donkey. He was the one that tied it up, and he was the one that prepared all of these details. They believe that Jesus set all this up beforehand. Well, if that's the case, I guess what Jesus had to do when Peter grabbed that fish and reached in and pulled those coins out to pay his taxes, I guess Jesus had to go swimming a couple of days before and put the coins in that fish's mouth. Now, friends, I don't believe those scholars when they say that Jesus went in and took care of all this beforehand. Here's what I believe. I don't believe he set it all up physically. I believe he set it all up because of his sovereignty. I believe he set it all up because of his personality. He is the divine God in human flesh, and he's capable of doing all things. These events remind us, friends, that Jesus is none other than almighty God in control of all things at all times. So to answer your question, are you going to preach like you did last Sunday? The answer is an emphatic yes. We're going to brag and brag and brag on Jesus because he is God. Amen. Now, friends, I don't know about you, but that encourages me because if this God and this personality is in charge of those details, I can rest assured that he is in charge of the details of my life and yours. I don't only see his personality, but here's the second thing I see. I see his power. Oh, look at his power. These verses demonstrate the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3 says it this way. When they ask you about this donkey, tell them the Lord has need of it. I don't know if you picked up on this detail, but Jesus just referred to himself as Lord. Jesus just referred to himself as God, the one with all power. That's a statement of his authority in this and every situation. Now, I would remind us all this morning that not only was he Lord when he said it on that day, but he's Lord today. 
You say, well, I got saved and I haven't quite made him Lord. Then you didn't quite get saved. Somebody say amen. You see, friends, he either is Lord of your life or he's not Lord of your life. And if he is the Savior of your soul, then he is the Lord of your life. That means he calls the shots. He gives the commands. He puts the orders in place and we simply obey. He is Lord. And he still possesses all that same power and authority whether we recognize it or not. And there will come a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that this Jesus is Lord. There will come a day when you will and I will confess publicly that he is Lord. Why not do it today? Why not make that decision today when salvation is still an option instead of waiting until it is eternally too late? Now Jesus was well known in these villages. He had performed other miracles. He's just raised Lazarus from the grave. He is, if you would uh, pardon these terms, a local celebrity. And when the owners heard that it was the Lord Jesus who wanted the colt, here's what they did. Immediately, they set him free. Look at verse 3 one more time. The Lord has need of him. Now, that's an amazing statement. Because actually, God really doesn't need anything. But in this particular story, we find great detail and many things that we can learn from this statement that the Lord has need of it. He's just going to borrow it for a little while. Friends, have you ever noticed in Scripture everything that Jesus needed, he only needed for a little while? Yeah. And he always gave it back. So think about this paradox of the Lord's earthly life. He was rich Yet he became poor. He borrowed a donkey just like he borrowed a grave. <laughs> Isn't that good news, friends? He owned all things, yet he possessed nothing. He created the stars, but he had nowhere to lay his head. He fashioned everything out of nothing, but he had to borrow a boat to preach from, a donkey to ride, and a grave to be buried in. He created every drop of water that's ever existed, yet on the cross we'll see him cry out, I'm thirsty. He created every tree, but he died on a borrowed cross. He created every rock. Every rock he created, but he had to borrow a tomb. He used the clouds previously as his chariots, yet now he rides on a donkey that has never been ridden. What a paradox of his life. It kind of reminds me of this old statement we find in Scripture. The last shall be first, and the first shall be last. So let's talk about this donkey just a little bit more, just a few more minutes. The Lord needed the donkey to fulfill a mission here on earth. That's amazing. Now, I don't want to be accused of calling all of you donkeys this morning, okay? Okay. Don't leave here this morning and say, I ain't never going back to that church again. That preacher called me a donkey. That's not what I'm doing. I'm just going to make a comparison if you'll give me a little freedom, okay? Think about this donkey. He only needed it to fulfill his earthly purpose. Well, isn't that what God's supposed to do with us? Is we're to make ourselves available so he can use us to fulfill his purpose on this earth. Jesus is God. He could have done it any way that he chose to do it, but he chose to use that donkey. Jesus is God. He could have fulfilled his ministry any way he wanted to, but he chooses you and he chooses me. Just like he used this donkey. He could have assigned this task to angels, but he chose a donkey. He could have chose his task of spreading the gospel to angels, but he chose you and he chose me. So look at what happens to this donkey. I find it very, very interesting. In verse 6, he says to tell these people that I'm only going to use it for a little while and I'll send it back immediately. Now what happens is that donkey came back better than it left. And that's exactly what happens to you and me, friends, when we allow God to use us. You see, when it left, it was unbroken. But when it comes back, it's learned to let somebody ride it. When it was there, it was still tied up. 
But when it came to Jesus, it was set free. Now, isn't that a good word? You see, when he takes something, he always gives it back better than when he took it. That's why we ought to be willing to give our spouses to Jesus because he'll send them back better. Stop trying to fix them and just give them to Jesus. That's why we ought to give our children to Jesus because he'll take them and give them back better. Now, some of you ought to say amen right there. Huh? Oh, I'll give them to Jesus right now, preacher, if they'll give them back better. You see what he did with Abram? Is he took a lost pagan and gave back Abraham, a mighty man of faith. And he took Jacob that was a schemer and a trickster and gave back Israel, a prince of God. He took Saul, who was a cruel man, and gave back Paul, the greatest apostle that's ever lived. He took Simon, a weak man, and gave back Peter that he called Rock. He took broken lives just like yours and mine and gives us a new start in heaven. So when I think about this picture of triumph, I have to start with the person. And when I look at the person in this story, it is Jesus. He's the hero. And I learn a lot about his personality. I also learn a lot about his power. Now, let me give you a second statement. Jot this down. I want you to notice in this picture the presentation of triumph. It's found in verses 7 through 10. The disciples go and get the donkey. They return to Jesus and put their outer garments on this animal in place of a saddle. Jesus climbs on the donkey's back and starts to ride down the mountain. The fact that that animal is allowing Jesus to ride it, even though it's never been broken, is a miracle in itself. I've never tried to ride a donkey. I have no intentions to. But I did try to put a cat in a pond one time. I was in Texas. I was about 12 years old. My uncle said, hey, see that tomcat over there? I said, yeah. He said, he loves to go swimming. Why don't you take that cat down there to that pond? It was about 114 degrees, and y'all just go for a quick swim. I didn't know any better. I picked that little tomcat up, and I went down there, and I started walking in that water. I'm telling you what's truth. That cat liked to kill me. <laughs> now, I don't imagine it'd be similar to that, to try to ride a donkey that had been untamed. But can you imagine, friends, can you imagine that donkey allowing its creator to ride it out as he saw fit? Well, that's what we ought to do, you bunch of donkeys. Now, I didn't mean to say that. That didn't come out right. We're just supposed to let him do as he wills in our lives. So the king of Israel is presenting himself to the nations, a man of triumph. And here are the two details I want you to notice. Detail number one, he is the lowly one. Jesus is fulfilling the ancient prophecy of Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 that we've already read together. And part of that prophecy says that this Messiah will be lowly. Here he is, riding on a donkey, not in a chariot, on a donkey. That's what we see here. A humble man on the back of a humble animal making a humble declaration of his identity as their king. Now just imagine this procession. Jesus on the back of this donkey doesn't even have a saddle surrounded by throngs of common people. One writer said it this way, this was nothing but a procession of paupers. He's sitting on old coats. He's riding on a little donkey, not a mighty stallion. But friends, don't you forget this. When he comes the next time, he will be riding on a stallion. And it will be clear to everyone, unlike that day, they didn't recognize him as king. But when he comes the next time, everyone will recognize and bow to him as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Make sure you're ready for his return. He's surrounded by a ragtag rabble and not strong soldiers. 
the Roman soldiers who saw this parade were most definitely laughing and mocking at this man claiming to be the king of the Jews. I can only imagine that many of these soldiers have witnessed in their journey what is called a Roman triumphus. And in those celebrations known as Roman triumphus, they saw victorious Roman uh, uh, officials and generals return from the battlefields with the spoils of war. Defeated kings and soldiers would be paraded through town. The victorious army would, would march around and, and be cheering in the crowds. The victorious general would be riding on the finest of chariots pulled along by handsome horses. Thousands would be cheering and Rome would vibrate with the shouts of people praising Caesar and other Roman gods. But this must have appeared to be nothing but a joke all to fulfill scripture, that he is the lowly one. This little processional, my friends, is just the beginning. You see, these events that begin on this day will end up toppling the Roman Empire. One day, this lowly king will bring Rome to its knees. So look again into the crowd. Who do you see? Well, I don't know about you, friends, but when I look into this crowd of palm branches and coats laid on the ground, I see blind Bartimaeus, yeah. who's just recently been given back his sight. I see blind Bartimaeus looking at the one that gave him his sight and singing Hosanna to his name. I don't know if you noticed, but I think I caught a glimpse of old Zacchaeus, the one that was climbing up in that tree just to get a glimpse of Jesus. And Jesus said, come down out of that tree because I'm going to your house today. Friends, it changes everything when Jesus comes to your house. I don't know if you saw him, but I caught a glimpse of Zacchaeus. And then there's Lazarus. <laughs> Little T.D. Jakes for you right there. Lazarus. <laughs> Hallelujah, man. I'm talking about somebody that was dead in the grave for days. The Bible said he started to smell. And when Jesus walked by, he said, come out of that grave. I'll guarantee you Lazarus was there. And I'll guarantee you he was shouting louder than anybody. And friends, I came this morning to tell you he brought you back out of that grave too because salvation is ours because of Jesus. Preacher, I thought you was retiring. You thought you was going to slow down. I ain't slowing down, not between now and then. This crowd was full of people that had been healed, delivered, and they are praising his name, the lowly one. But you know what? Here's another detail. I not only see the lowly one, <laughs> I also see the lofty one. You know what lofty means? It means being praised. As the crowd descended on the slopes of the Mount of Olives, these people are praising the Lord. Now they're practicing what is known, this is a big word for me, i got to slow down here, an antiphonal singing. An antiphonal singing is when somebody in the front of the crowd says something and then the other people in the back of the crowd repeat it back. And so somebody in the front of the crowd singing Hosanna and the rest are repeating it back. That's what it says in verse 9 and 10. The word Hosanna means save now. Yeah. Can you imagine, friend, Jesus riding in town on this donkey and these people that have experienced these miracles are crying out loud to him, save now? It was a cry for the Messiah to deliver his people. He had come to be used, or it had come to be used as a shout of praise, just like we say, hallelujah. These people are singing praises to the lofty one who is also the lowly one. These people are praising the name of King Jesus, just like the psalmist predicted that they would. Now Luke tells us that the Pharisees are upset about it. Oh, here come the Pharisees. You know who the Pharisees are, right? That's them high-class church people. 
high class church people don't understand grace. All they want to talk about is the law. The Pharisees are upset about this demonstration. They want Jesus to tell his followers to stop all their shouting. Now, friends, you watch this. Make a note of it. Every time somebody really gets on fire for praising and worshiping Jesus, that crowd's going to raise up their ugly head. And they're going to want somebody to tell them they need to calm down a little bit. Somebody starts shouting and clapping. And they're going to say, Preacher, you need to talk to them and tell them they need to stay reverent. Friends, what I see in this picture is a beautiful picture of reverence as they're shouting, Hosanna to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jesus tells them, Hey, watch this. Jesus says to them, Y'all don't understand. If I tell them to be quiet, the rocks are going to cry out and worship me. That's what he said. If I tell them to stop praising me, the mountains are going to praise my name. And friends, you've heard it said for years, I don't want a rock doing what God created me to do. So as long as he saves sinners, <clears throat> I don't hurt my throat. My sinuses are killing me. My throat's hurting. And I'm going to do this again. And I'm going to do it better the next time than I did. This is just practice time. This is just warm-up time. I'm going to do it better in second service. As long as he saves sinners and makes saints, there's going to be someone to praise his name. As long as he keeps rescuing people out of the gutter, there are going to be people praising his name. As long as he keeps delivering us from alcohol and drug and mental illness, there are going to be people praising his name. So I got news for them Pharisees. I got a word for them Pharisees. Jesus said, I'm not going to tell them to be quiet. So, I, I, I don't want the rocks to praise the lowly one nor the lofty one in my praise. Now, I got one more statement for it. Just one more statement. And that's the purpose of this triumph. What's this all about? Well, it's found in verse 11. He did two things in this story. First thing he did was examine the town. Imagine, according to Luke, now I know we read Mark, but according to Luke, as Jesus neared the city, he saw Jerusalem and he saw the future of Jerusalem. And Jesus being God knew that within 40 years, <clears throat> the Romans would take control of that town. Jesus knew that 30,000 Jews would be crucified as legions of soldiers marched through that city. He knew that the city would be held up for months. And many would suffer disease and even starvation. He knew because he was God that the Romans would conquer that city and even the temple would be demolished. He knew that those Roman soldiers would in just 40 years be throwing dead bodies of Jewish people over the city walls. He knew all these things and more. And Luke said he wept over the city of Jerusalem. As he's walking into this city, or riding into this city on a donkey, they're praising his name, and he's crying over that town because they all didn't realize who he was. So I want you to get that image in your mind. They're shouting, they're dancing, they're singing, they're praising God, they're shouting Hosanna, <clears throat> they're excited, expressing it vocally, but Jesus is brokenhearted. He knows that Israel will not receive him. He knows that they're going to reject him and even crucify him. He knows that he is slated not for praise, but for crucifixion. Not jubilation, but death. And he weeps. That's why he's called a man of sorrows. Have you ever wondered what Jesus sees when he looks at our town? We may see economic struggles. We see people that are good-hearted and mean well. 
We see people who get on our nerves and irritate us. Somebody say amen. We may even be spiritual and see prospects for our church. We see friends and neighbors. We see saints and we see sinners. But what does Jesus see? Jesus sees those that are suffering. He sees those that are lost. Jesus sees those that are on their way to hell. And oh, how we need to see as Jesus sees. There's a little tongue twister from years ago. I'm going to try to get it right. They would use this tongue twister to train door-to-door salesmen. And it went something like this. It's talking about a man named Joe Jones. To sell Joe Jones what Joe Jones buys, you must see Joe Jones through Joe Jones' eyes. What does that mean? Well, it means if you're going to sell him whatever it is that you're selling, you're going to have to see life the way he sees it so you can then figure out how to get him to buy what you're selling. Does it make sense? To sell Joe Jones what Joe Jones buys, we must see Joe Jones through Joe Jones' eyes. A great preacher who's in heaven now, Dr. Quartz from Winston-Salem, once said it this way. To save Joe Jones before Joe Jones dies, we must see Joe Jones through God's own eyes. What a great word. How do you see your town? How does God see your town? So he came to examine the town. And then lastly, he came to examine the temple. Oh, this is going to get personal now. You know what he's doing? He's examining the church. The last thing Jesus did on that day was to visit the temple. He took time to go in the temple. And the Bible says here that when he walked in, he looked around and he saw everything. He saw the beautiful buildings. He saw the gold and the silver. He saw the detail in every situation. He saw the priest carrying out the rituals and offering their sacrifices, knowing that he is going to be the final sacrifice. He saw people burning the sacrifices uh, before the priest. He saw it all. Friends, I want you to notice that they didn't see him. Yeah, they saw his physical body, but they didn't see who he was. The king had entered the temple The people didn't know it. The Lord of glory had visited his own house and the people were ignorant to his presence. He saw that they had no place for him in his own place of worship. So we got to ask some serious questions. What does Jesus see when he comes to our church? And the reality is he is here. So the question is, does he see people looking for him or people just going through the motions? I'm just showing you a picture today of this person of triumph. And I'm just asking questions. Does he see us here ready to worship or does he see us here just caught up in rituals and routine? More importantly than that, what does he see in your heart? Is it a heart full of praise for him? It's a heart full of earnest worship. Is a heart striving for holiness. Or maybe in your heart he sees lostness. You can come to him today. So in conclusion, we'll end much like we started with the words of Zechariah from chapter 9, verse 9. Zechariah said to them centuries before, your king is coming to you. So I'm here to tell you this morning, friends, our king is coming back. He is going to make a return. But until then, he is here for you today. He wants to receive you. He wants to restore you. He wants to save your soul. So why don't you come to know Jesus this day? 
Would you stand with me, church, and let's just celebrate this picture of triumph. The Lord Jesus Christ coming into town, examining his church as we begin to look toward the events of the crucifixion, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Now, during this time of invitation, I'm going to invite you to do something. I want you to come. I want you to come maybe just to pray. I want you to come and say, Pastor, I'm ready to join this church. I've been a guest here for a while, and we know that this is where God wants us. I want you to come. You need to come today and say, Pastor, I need to be baptized. I know I'm saved, but I really want to be obedient. I need to be baptized by immersion. And some of you need to come today and say, Pastor, I need to be saved. I'm not ready to meet God. And if he were to come back today, I would be lost forever. Friends, forever is a long time to live without God. And this world is much too difficult for you to live without God. So you come to Jesus today. I'll be right here waiting on.